Good afternoon. I'm uh, going to talk, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, finding lunar polar ice. And uh, sort of what I want to do is to kind of go over what I think uh, the issues are, what, what do we really know about the poles of the moon, and how can we resolve this issue once and for all. So first of all, let's, let's do a little tutorial on the moon. The nature of the moon is, it's, it's, this is my slide, the moon on a view graph. Basically, the moon is a rocky object and its geological evolution was largely completed by about uh, three billion years ago. Since then, all that's happened is the occasional infall of a meteorite and the grinding up the surface rocks into this powdery stuff called the regolith. An interesting thing about the moon is that compositionally, it's, it's volatile depleted. It's a refractory object. It doesn't have any atmosphere at all. There are no high minerals of hydration in the lunar rocks. There's no evidence that the moon ever had any water of any significant amount. In fact, the moon uh, magmas, the, the Mare basalt magmas, crystallize under very, very reducing conditions, very low partial pressure of oxygen. And fundamentally, the depletion factors are, are so extreme that, in fact, it's a constraint on lunar origin. The moon can't be an object independently accreted like other planets made out of the same stuff, out of carbonaceous chondrites, which is the building block of the planets. It has to be built out of something that's already been processed. Now that in part led to the idea of the origin of the moon by the giant impact. You had two planets that had already been differentiated. They collided, very high energy, high temperature event, and so therefore a lot of the volatiles were driven off from the moon. So the lunar samples, what we know of them, are that they are extremely dry and extremely reduced. Now that doesn't mean that the moon itself is depleted of all volatiles. And the reason is, is because there's external addition of volatiles. As the moon is hit by material from space, and it is constantly, Volatile material is added, and the volatile material is contained in these objects, in cometary cores, in meteorites, water-bearing meteorites, interplanetary dust particles. All of these objects contain either water bound in silicates or water present in the form of, of ice, either crystallized ice or amorphous ice. In addition to a whole bunch of other volatiles, a lot of things that are available early in solar system history beyond the water line in the solar system. These things are constantly striking the moon. Now ordinarily, if these things hit the moon, they're not stable on the lunar surface. The moon's surface is very hot, it's 100 degrees centigrade at, 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 at noon and minus 150 at midnight. That's a huge temperature swing, and so typically volatile elements don't stay in one place. They hop around, they migrate, they get excited thermally, and they might bounce around on the surface. If they find a place where they're stable, they'll stay there. And if they don't, they'll just keep bouncing around until ultimately they're lost to space. Now the interesting thing we found out about the moon over the last few years is the poles of the moon is, really, is, is a really interesting environment. And that's largely a consequence of the spin axis orientation of the moon. Uh, fundamentally, the spin axis of the moon is inclined, you see in this cartoon, one and a half degrees. That's nearly perpendicular. So as the moon is, is orbits around the Earth, its orientation with respect to the ecliptic, with respect to the sun, is such that near, it's nearly vertical to that plane. So that means if you're at the pole, what you will see over the course of a lunar day, which is a rotation of 108 hours, you will see the moon or the sun move around the horizon 360 degrees, all along the horizon. Sometimes it'll be slightly above, sometimes it'll slightly be below, but effectively the sun is at the horizon all the time. Now if you're in, if the moon's perfectly smooth, this is what you'd see, but in fact the moon has topography. So if you're on a peak, you might see the sun all the time, and if you're in a hole, you might never see the sun. And that simple principle, the orientation spin axis, is responsible for the unique environment of the poles. The interesting thing about the dark areas is that they don't get any thermal energy from any place but, but two sources. One is space, so that's three degree background radiation, and the other is the heat flow of the moon, which is a number that we don't know very well. Uh, our best guess comes from the two heat flow measurements at the Apollo 17 and 15 landing sites which suggests values between two and three microwatts per, per square centimeter. And if you go through the calculations, basically that means that a cold trap on the moon, a, a dark area, something that never sees sunlight, might be as cold as 50 Kelvin. It could be as, as warm as 90 Kelvin. But anything below 100 Kelvin is what we call a cold trap. And what that means is if a volatile element gets in to one of these cold traps, there's no known physical process to remove it. It's there forever. So as these things are gradually added, even though it's an extremely slow rate, even though we're adding these things atom and molecule by molecule over billions of years, a very slow process over a very long period of time equals a finite amount of material. Now, 
impacts will churn up the surface. They'll stir it up and, and mix it, but they can't remove the volatiles. What they can do is they'll, they'll, they'll hit the surface, they'll volatilize the target, but if it's still in the cold trap, it'll just recondense. Now, if it, if, it's, if it blasts enough out of it at, at escape velocity, yes, you'll lose that. That is a loss mechanism. So somehow, if the stuff is to be there, it has to be added at rates larger than the, loss, the possible loss mechanisms. There are other loss mechanisms, too, and I'll talk about them in a minute. Anyway, that was the background back in 1994 when we were orbiting the moon with Clementine. And we did not have any instruments on the Clementine mission to specifically look for ice on the moon, but we improvised an experiment. And what we did was to basically use the spacecraft radio transmitter as an illumination source and study the echoes coming back from the moon, beamed to the moon by Clementine. The Clementine transmitter was S-band. It's transmitted right circular polarization. Now, radi ice is an interesting material. It, it, to, to radio frequency, pure ice is transparent. So the, uh, the, basically, the radio waves will penetrate ice. And they will be multiply scattered by impurities, dislocations, and, and fractures in the ice. So when you shine right circular polarized material on a powdery surface, you get polarization inversion. Or you basically change RCP to LCP. But when you shine it on ice, when you shine right circular polarized radio on ice, you get the LCP bounce initially, but then it penetrates the ice and is multiply scattered. So some reflections you'll get back in the same sense you sent them. So when you measure that, take that ratio, the amount of the same sense to the opposite sense, that's called the circular polarization ratio. Keep that in mind because that's going to be very important as we go on later on. Anything that has a CPR, circular polarization ratio, less than one is behaving like a typical silicate powder regolith on a planetary surface. But if you have a CPR that's greater than one, it can be either due to one of two things, and we'll cover this as we go on a little bit. What Clementine did was to beam RCP into the pole. We had two ground tracks. Orbit 234 went right through the dark area, and Orbit 235 was in the sunlit area, an area that gets sunlight for at least part of the lunar day. That was our control. The results are shown in the plot on the bottom. And what we see here is the circular polarization ratio, RCP over LCP, as a function of beta angle, which is the phase angle. As the spacecraft orbited the moon, it went from plus 10 to minus 10 degrees. It went through zero phase. Zero phase is when you're perfectly in line with the transmitting antenna. What we're looking for was an opposition surge. You often see this on the moon in lunar photographs uh, at zero phase, when you see a brightness around the center part where the, it's called zero phase line. You see the same thing with light. This we're looking for in radio. And what you see is in orbit 234, which is the one that was over the polar area, you saw an enhancement in CPR, a peak in CPR that occurred coincident with the dark area which we interpreted as being Scoby from, from water ice. Now that stood, that was published in 96, and it caused a great deal of controversy because it was very, we, first of all, we only had one observation. We couldn't repeat the experiment. And secondly, it was very low fidelity. We had a very big footprint on Clementine. We weren't able to cover the pole repeatedly. We only did this as an experiment of opportunity when we were moving the orbit of, orbital uh, paraloon of Clementine from 30 south to 30 north. Now two years later, a uh, lunar prospector flew around the moon. It carried a different instrument. It carried a neutron spectrometer that basically measures the flux of neutrons as a function of energy. Hydrogen, whether in ice as the form of water ice, whether in uh, atomic hydrogen, or whether it bound in mineral structures, absorbs the flow of medium energy neutrons. So when you see a low in the flux of medium energy neutrons, that indicates a high in the amount of hydrogen. In a nutshell, a uh, lunar prospector found elevated amounts of hydrogen at both poles, both at the north and the south. The elevation levels are about a factor of two above the highest levels we see around the equator. So we're not talking about a lot of hydrogen. The reason that, that it's a significant amount is because it covers such a large area. Lunar Prospector was a spinning spacecraft, so it didn't look at the moon. It had a, it had a four pi field of view. And its resolution is effectively fixed by the orbital altitude. The best resolution from the Lunar Prospector was 30 kilometers. So it's about a 40, meter, 40 kilometer pixel. So we're looking at very large areas of the moon that are enhanced by a factor of two of hydrogen. That could be due to one of two things. Either you have a uniform elevated amount, about a factor of two over this area, or you have small areas of very, very high concentration, and the rest of it around it is, is normal. So th this instrument cannot distinguish between those two cases. So let's look at this a little bit, because the distribution pattern of the spectrometer data is quite interesting. This is the south polar map. Uh, the map on the left is the, uh, is the epithermal flux. Blue is low. 
And what you see here is that the shadow on the Clementine mosaic, basically the area is around S for Shackleton, U1 and U2 and Cabeus, all of these areas are near permanent darkness, as near as we can tell. And you see that maps out pretty well with the distribution of the epithermal neutron flux at the South Pole. The North Pole doesn't map so well. The North Pole is a little more hard to understand. What you see is a big smeared out pattern of low epithermal flux. And you see not a big contiguous area of dark, but actually a whole bunch of smaller areas of darkness. The highest anomaly we see is up here in this crater that's up there at about the, the one o'clock position. Uh, uh, I, I forget its name. I think it's uh, Wies Wies Wiesowski J or something like that. And uh, that is the highest signal that we see. And basically, you're looking at the permanently the north-facing slope, which is always in permanent shadow. And so fundamentally, the North Pole is less clear of the correspondence between the low flux and permanent shadow. When you, you can convert these into different water equivalent maps. And when you do that, the apparent abundance you see, maximum abundance, is about 0.17%. That's, remember, that's the, unsme the, the best resolution data we have. It's very low. Well, you can play games with this. You can take this data, you can take this original low resolution data and say, all right, let's assume for a moment that this is caused by ice. And that, it, therefore, it's only stable in the, in the shadowed areas. What would that distribution look like? In other words, I'm taking, I'm doing a what-if experiment. So at the North Pole, what that leads to is this map where I've only mapped water, or what I call WEH, water equivalent hydrogen, by weight percent, in areas where I know there's permanent shadow. And so what you see is that in some areas you see uh, deposits of water that exceed one weight percent. And that's one weight percent for the entire thing. So it's actually, it could be, for certain selected areas, it could be as high as 40 or 50 weight percent for small areas but the average concentration over a big area, 20 kilometer area, is about 1%. When you do the same thing at the South Pole, you get very similar numbers. In this case, and, and interestingly enough, at the South Pole, the highest value you get is not at the pole, not at Shackleton. It's at a, a feature called Cabeus, which is up there at about the 10 o'clock position. It's on the shadow side, the pole side of a giant South Pole Aiken Basin Massif. So it's a big mountain. It has a big shadowed area. That's the highest area that we see in the neutron data. So clearly, we need better information. We need higher fidelity information. And we need to look at this area in higher resolution. Now, there's one other data set I want to talk about. And that's the Earth-based radar, which has gotten a lot of discussion. What does the Earth-based radar really say about the distribution of, of, of possible ice on the moon? Remember how we find ice with radar. You're looking for a special signature. You're looking for the signature of circular polarization ratio that is, that is more the same sense than the opposite sense transmitted. You're looking for that enhancement in that ratio. And what you find when you look at, at a map, uh, a circular polarization ratio map of poles is that there is CPR, high CPR all around. If you look on that left image, you'll see a lot of little speckled areas. Those are all high CPR targets in the, in the South Polar area. And occasionally you find larger contiguous areas. This is the crater Shackleton, and you've got a great big piece of high CPR there inside the crater. I should point out, by the way, this is a radar image. So the illumination that you see here is caused by the radar. It's not caused by sunlight. The entire floor of Shackleton is dark, permanently dark. What you're seeing is you're seeing inside the permanently dark, the shadow there is the Earth radar shadow. That's the part of the crater we cannot see from the Earth. Now the question is, is this caused by by the presence of ice in this dark area, or is it caused by surface roughness? Now this brings us to the, the new data. This was published in Nature a few months ago. I, should, I, I want to digress for a minute and talk a little bit about why high CPR can be caused by roughness. Remember, we talked about how you get the high CPR from ice. It penetrates the ice. It's multiply scattered. You get some of the same sense back that you send. You can also get the same thing from a, from a blocky surface. And the reason is that on a blocky surface, if you have a lot of angular rocks, you have a lot of small corner reflectors. And suppose I have two rocks that are lying against each other like this, and they're pointing at, my, at the Earth. And I send in a ray, and it's right circular polarized here. It inverts to less circular polarized. It bounces over to this facet, and it gets re-inverted. So I'm getting back the same sense that I saw. So you can see that surface roughness can simulate this high CPR that you get from ice. So the conclusion here is that CPR is not a unique measurement. It's just a measurement you have to take in conjunction with a lot of other stuff. Now these are the new images from Campbell et al. night in 2006, which shows the South Polar area. Shackleton's down there at the bottom. A map of CPR is right here on the right. And what you, the most noticeable thing is this, this crater here, uh, Schoenberger A, 
which is a big halo of high CPR. And that's largely caused by the presence of a very rough ejecta blanket around that crater. Now this is the, the crater Shackleton and the two data sets, the old and the new. And what you see is that the new, in the new data, it's much higher resolution. You see that the texture, the surface texture that we saw on the earlier thing is actually a little more complex than we thought. But the interesting thing is that the high CPR area still continues into the darkness. And this anomaly, by the way, the one that's inside the crater there at about 8 o'clock on the wall of the crater is the exact, it's right under the ground track, the beta zero ground track of Clementine. So we believe that, in fact, is what gave us our result that we published on Science in 1996. So the question is, is that surface roughness or is it caused by the presence of ice? That's radar shadow. Right? Well, here's a comparison. This image on the left is from the SMART-1 mission, taken picture from the Amy Imager. And what you see is that the entire interior, this is about as illuminated as Shackleton ever gets from the seasonal exposure. The entire interior of Shackleton is dark, and yet, you see these high CPR patches on the wall of Shackleton, which are in permanent darkness. Now here's a pay, uh, figure from the Campbell paper where they tried to show that this was all caused by surface roughness. This is the Schoenberger G and Shackleton compared. It's just an opposite sense image on the left and a CPR map on, on the right. And what, you, what their claim was, well, Schoenberger G is in sunlight, and we see high CPR in the crater. Shackleton is in darkness, and we see high CPR in the crater. This can't be ice on the bottom case because that's in sunlight. That actually sees the interior sea sunlight. Therefore, the stuff in Shackleton is not ice either. Now, my claim was, in fact, if you look carefully, you actually see a different pattern. With Schoenberger G, you see the high CPR on the upper crater walls, which is just where you'd expect to see an outcrop. That's what you see in high resolution, photo high resolution photographs of the moon. But the CPR decreases as you go into the crater. In other words, if it's the roughness, the CPR, the roughness caused CPR in this case decreases going into the crater because the average block size must decrease. That's the only explanation for that. But the case in Shackleton is different. You see high CPR both deep in the crater and high on the crater, and occasionally you see the upper parts of the wall with lower CPR. So it's not the same distribution. And in fact, this brings me to my point about what does high CPR really mean? Does it, what does it really tell us? Well, one thing to consider is the case of mercury. These two images down here, the little black and white images here, the low resolution on the bottom, that is the discovery image of ice on Mercury. That was made by Molman and Brian Butler back in the early 90s. And what, if you note, right at the top, there's a, two little white smudges. That's the Mercurian polar cap. And fundamentally, what they saw was a very high CPR return at the poles of Mercury. A higher resolution version of it is shown at the top. That was taken by Harman a few years later. And you can see that this ice-like material, this high CPR material, is confined to the crater floors of mercury. The interesting thing about the original discovery photograph is when you look at it, is you also see high CPR at mid-latitudes in the equator, too. So what's going on? And if, 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 if CPR is not caused by, if, ice, if, this CPR, if high CPR is caused by ice at the poles, how can you possibly have ice at the equator in the mid-latitudes of mercury? Right? You can't. What this image tells you is that CPR can be caused by two things, and it was the two things we discussed earlier. It's either surface roughness or ice. It can be either. Now, my contention is, is that if you have high CPR in the sunlight, it's probably caused by roughness. If you have high CPR in the shadow, it could be either. It could be either roughness or it could be ice. You don't know which one. So, where does that leave us? Does ice exist on the moon? Well, let's review the evidence briefly. Clementine found evidence of an enhancement of CPR over the dark area, but not over the corresponding lit area of the moon back in 1994. Lunar Prospector found elevated amounts of hydrogen at both poles, and in fact, with a very interesting distribution where they occur partly in, the, in, in shadow, and yet sometimes it looks like it's spread out over the north. And Earth-based radar shows high CPR, but it shows it both in the sunlit areas and the shadowed areas. So what does that mean? All right. What, what first thing it tells us is remote sensing data cannot uniquely resolve this problem. Effectively, to really resolve what you've got and what its physical state is, you have to go down to the surface and actually make a measurement in situ. But fundamentally, I would contend the following. I think that ice does exist on the moon, and I think it occurs in the, in, in, in the permanently shadowed areas, but the actual emplacement mechanisms and the amounts are not known. So effectively, when we're looking at this with, with incomplete or, or low resolution data, we get ambiguous results. 
I think they cover large parts of the terrain, but in fact, uh, I think it has, it's, it's heterogeneously distributed. In places you have high concentrations of it, and in other places you don't, which to me suggests that we're not looking at the end result of a steady state process. You're looking at a stochastic process. You're adding stuff at high rates, at very high amounts in certain places, and at very low rates or not at all elsewhere. Or you have a loss mechanism that differentiates between those two. I think it's the, the, the one interesting thing about the neutron data is you see the ice signature and the epithermal flux, you don't see it in the fast neutrons. What that means is, is that since neutrons only sample the upper 30 centimeters or so of the moon and the upper 10 centimeters are desiccated, right, it's very hard to understand that model where you have high hydrogen below that level and no hydrogen in the uppermost surface by a solar wind implantation model. It doesn't make any sense. If it was solar wind, you'd expect to see an enhancement at the surface. You don't see that. So it suggests to me that instead, you've got some loss process that's gradually losing any kind of ice that's in the uppermost surface until you reach a stable depth. I think the upper couple of meters is probably saturated with this, with this ice, whatever its origin. And, and it, it's, it, it, in some places, you might have nearly pure ice, which accounts for the high CPR that you get. And in other places, you might have, have it finely disseminated in, into, the, into the regolith. You're not going to know until you get down on the surface and actually make a measurement. If this material is from comets, and I think it probably is, because that's the most likely source for a lot of the ice, it's probably got other stuff too. It's probably got methane, ammonia, and other volatile elements. And that comes from the, basically what we know about cometary objects. And they're, they're largely water ice. This is basically in Hale-Bopp. That's sort of an inventory of some of the, the, the species. It's mostly water ice, but you see you do have other things like, like uh, ammonia and carbon dioxide and uh, carbon monoxide and methane, all of which are useful, by the way. If you can find these volatile elements in the moon, you can use, use them to do a lot of industrial processing. Uh, it's, it's a good resource if we can actually find them. So what don't we know? Well, that's the list of our ignorance, and you can see it's virtually everything. We don't know where the stuff is, we don't know what its physical state is, we don't know how much there is, and we don't know how to get to it. So what that tells me is that there's a lot, if you're going to go to the moon, you want to use this stuff to actually create uh, both life support and propellant to use, you need to get there and find out what the physical, what, what's the nature of the ore body that you're dealing with. I think the way you do that is you can do it from both orbit, but ultimately you have to go to the ground. You need both orbital measurements and you need landed elements. And for orbital measurements, you want to map its distribution as best you can, and then once you find areas of promising content, to land and make the measurements in situ. <clears throat> so that brings us to the orbital data, and I get to talk about my experiment. Chandrayaan-1, which is the Indian mission to the moon, is going to be launched. Uh, actually, it's going to be launched now on April 9th of next year is the current launch date. We just passed our CDR last week. I was over in India for that. That's going to carry my imaging radar, which is an S-band radar, which uh, transmits the right circuit are polarized and actually receives uh, uh, H and V linear polarization, but it receives it uh, in phase, it receives it coherently. So from that data, we'll actually be able to reconstruct the Stokes parameters of the scattering matrix of the moon. We'll be able to understand the backscattered field of the polar deposits in great detail. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to distinguish between the corner reflector CPR that I described and the actual volume scattering that you get with, with ice, ice scattering. It's also carrying a variety of other instruments, including uh, topography, uh, from laser, uh, stereoscopic imaging, and a very interesting experiment that's carrying to actually look at the migration of lead 210 across the moon. That might seem to be a distraction from the question about ice, but it's not, because lead 210 is a volatile, and its migration pattern as it decays and moves across the moon will tell us a lot about how volatiles could have accumulated in the dark areas. Then that will be followed by a lunar reconnaissance orbiter, which Lori talked about earlier, you heard about that. We have a version of MINISAR on that spacecraft as a tech demo. It's slightly advanced. It has two, two things going forward over the, the Chandrayaan radar. One is it has a zoom motor resolution, a factor of 10 higher. Chandrayaan resolution is going to be uh, pretty low, 75 meters per pixel. With the LRO, we'll be able to get uh, less than 10 meters per pixel in certain areas of the moon. Secondly, it has two frequencies. It has S-band and X-band. Again, ratioing those will allow us to better distinguish between surface and volume scattering. Now, once you map these things from orbit, you need to go down on the surface and make measurements in place. Originally, we had looked at the idea of a lander that carried a rover, landed on the rim of the crater, and then roved down into the crater to measure the ice. Uh, 
But it turned out that that got too costly, so we looked at breaking that down into two missions, basically landing on the rim first and making a measurement, calibrating the, hydro the lunar prospector hydrogen maps from the surface by getting an in-situ measurement. Then on a second mission, land in the floor of the crater and rove around and get enough samples to determine what the, ice it, what the volatile phase is and what its state is. No matter what happens, if you're going to the poles and you're going to use resources, you're going to have to do these missions. Whether you do them in 2012 or 2012, or whether you do them in 2024, or whether you do them in 2100, you've got to understand what you're dealing with if you're going to use this as a feedstock for processing. This is some of the things you'll, you'll learn by, by studying lunar volatiles. I, I actually prepared this slide for a science talk, and, and it, I, I thought it was kind of impressive because this is a field of lunar science about which we know very, very little. Uh, a lot of lunar science is, is pretty cut and dry. We've got the Apollo samples, we've got remote sensing global data. We pretty much understand to a first order the evolution of the moon. A lot of the details are missing, but it's, it's, and it's a fascinating story. But in, in, this is a whole new area of lunar science about which we really know nothing at all. And it could tell us quite a bit about the origin and evolution of uh, this part of the solar system. Is that slide on the web? I'm sorry? Is that slide on the web? Uh, no, but it can be. I'll, I'll, I'll put it up there later. Um, so effectively, what's, who cares? What's the purpose of all this? Well, I think that the reason that you're interested in ice is because fundamentally it's the low-hanging fruit. You know, in terrestrial mining, you always go for the high-grade ore first. And we can go to the equator and we can suck out solar wind hydrogen at 50 parts per million. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of waste to dispose of. If there is ice at the poles of the moon, it's, it's a concentrated form of easily usable, easily extractable hydrogen. And hydrogen is the key element. That's the element that's rare on the moon. You can get oxygen anywhere. The moon's 40% by weight oxygen. Hydrogen is the element that's rare, and you need to go where the, it's the Willie Sutton principle. You go where the hydrogen is. That's paraphrased. So I'll just close with that, and uh, be glad to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Dennis. This is going to sound like a cop-out. We don't know enough. We don't know enough. Actually, I, I still like the South, and, and the reason is, I think both of them are potentially good resource places. The reason I like the South is because that's on the floor of the biggest basin in the solar system, and I want to study that geologically. So if we build our outpost there, I bet I'll have plenty to do. But it may well turn out that based on the thing I was telling with the, with the distribution of the hydrogen, it may well turn out that uh, the North Pole has the more concentrated forms. Because the, the, the argument here is, that although it's the same average enhancement, since the shadowed areas are much smaller, that means that the heterogeneous concentration would be much higher for a, for a given amount of shadowed area. So it may well be that the highest concentrations of ice in the moon occur at the North Polar craters. What yes? Is, what has the greater amount of Sorry? Well, that's an interesting question. We, we actually saw, on Clementine, we saw places at the north that had 100% sunlight, but that was in the summer. And we've looked at those same areas with the smart data, and they are not illuminated all the time in the winter. So we already knew there was no permanent sunlight at the south. So there is no permanent sunlight on the moon that we know of. Now, having said that, there are areas that are illuminated for more than 70 or 80% of the day, and, and, and you need to work around that. But I think that's doable. Yeah. What's the mass of your Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I know. The, I remember the payload mass. I don't remember the lander mass. The, the, the payload mass is only a couple hundred kilograms, because we're just doing static measuring. We're not delivering a rover. But ultimately, if you want to deliver a rover, you need to land about 500 kilograms. So I, I think it turns out to be 3,000 pounds. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I better not say because I'm not. I'm not certain. Sure. Yeah, you do. Well, in any, any place you go at the pole, you need to have a commsat because you don't have continuous line of sight. So you either want to go at the time of the maximum uh, libration where you, can, where you do have line of sight and do your mission quickly, or you're going to have to have a communications relay asset to get your data back. If you go to the floor, you're going to have to have a relay because there's no other way. Yeah. Permanently shadowed areas get some bounce thermal re-emission from 
areas on a crater rim that right. have sunlight. How right. much does that contribute to the temperature? And when you have a crater inside a permanently shadowed zone, how much colder is that? Yeah, we, we don't know, but it's been modeled, and it's, it's on the order of a few tens of degrees. So it's significant. But you're right. I, in fact, it's likely that, that in these areas where you do have ice in the crater, you're probably in craters within craters for that very reason, because they're, they're colder. Yes? How much uh, information do we have on the binding of ice and soil? Zero. Uh, you, you know, here, here's the thing. You've got, you've, got a, you've got an angular regolith that's being churned up by micrometeorite bombardment, and you're depositing water at, at the molecular level at an extremely slow rate. I don't think we have any idea what the physical result of that is. We know what the flux should be, what the cometary flux is, the or the wet water. If you didn't find any, would you be very surprised? Yes, but it would tell me that I, don't, I either don't understand the flux or I don't understand all the loss mechanisms. See, a lot of people say there can't be ice on the moon. This is Jack Schmidt's argument. He says there's no ice there because the regolith formation would destroy it. Well, I'm, my, I look at it differently. I say, well, if, if we observe ice there, that means your understanding of the regolith is wrong or, or incomplete at best. So let's, let's answer the question first and then decide whether it's possible or not. You know, the, the greatest discoveries come from things that people have said couldn't, couldn't possibly be. I remember it's very, it's very funny because, uh, you know, we had a big argument 10 years ago about whether you could get rocks from Mars. It was impossible. You know, they'd be accelerated so fast they'd liquefy. You couldn't possibly send them and keep them intact. Well, guess what? The, the understanding of the cratering process was wrong. And they had to go back, and now, of course, it was their idea all along. <laughs> yeah, you, you had your hand up there. I'm sorry. Well, uh, Dennis, uh, got some good estimates on uh, routine contributions to the moon's surface from, for example, the landed meteor stream or the Perseid meteor stream or any of the other regular meteor streams that intersect both the moon and the Earth's orbit. Intersect the moon and the Earth at certain times. Well, you know, there is a program that actually watch impact flashes when, whenever the moon passes through these, these various uh, streams. And they have seen them. They photograph them. Yeah. There was a thing on, on the NASA website here a while back, Science and NASA, they found Yeah, you know, a lot of people look at this about the, the rates of impact and, and, and how that's changed with time. I don't know anything about that myself. That's, that's out of my field. I, I do know that there is evidence that the flux on, on geologic time scales can be quite variable. In other words, it's not a constant flux from three billion years till now. But how that varies on different cuts of the time scale, I don't know. There's, there's some evidence to suggest that recently the flux has increased in about the last hundred million years. Yeah. You can have end-to-end -end models where the ice is in segregated lenses or where it's marginal if if it's present in a homogeneous one and a half percent, we won't see it. We won't, we won't see it with the radar. It's got to be present at least locally in a nearly pure form. So at least on the multiple, the tens of wavelength scale. So we're talking about meter-sized bodies of ice. We can see that. I, I'm running out. I guess it's time for me to quit, unless there's one more quick one. Well, you mentioned the use of L1 in your presentation before. Yes. Um, well, basically, what my, my, my point there was is that if you're going to start manufacturing propellant, it creates all kinds of operational difficulties to send your product to low lunar orbit, and then have to transfer that to some place where you can use it. So I was, I was saying L1 as a node was important in that case, because that's where I was to put my refueling depot, or sizzling. Thanks,